Good morning, everyone. My name is Eric Thompson, and I'm one of the regulatory compliance managers here at SHEAR. We are very excited to spend some time to talk with you about the fully redesigned GB1000 Great Basin Grease Interceptor and speak with some of your peers during a question and answer session on grease interceptors. This presentation should take about 30 minutes, and to keep it on track, we've disabled the ability to comment. Before we get into the new GB1000, I wanted to briefly review some of the market background information. Since the EPA's Clean Water Act was enacted in the 1970s, 1,000 gallon concrete grease interceptors have become the number one specified size and type in the industry. These units are guaranteed to fail and offer zero performance ratings. The tides are turning toward non-corrosive and performance rated products like the Great Basin with AHJs and specification engineers across the country. The first Great Basin model was introduced in 2006, forever changing the grease interceptor industry. Over time, more models were added to the series and by 2018, the lineup included eight sizes ranging from 10 gallons to 1,000 gallons. And now we are happy to introduce you to the all new redesigned from the ground up GB1000. Hey, thanks for watching. Uh, there's more information available on the website. And uh, now I'm going to turn the mic over to Ken Laux, who has rejoined Shear, the Shear team as the regulatory or senior regulatory compliance manager to introduce our panelist. Ken. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome, to, first of all, to this uh, and virtual launch of the GB1000 and our panel discussion. And I'm thrilled to be able to talk with friends in the industry that uh, I've made over the years. Uh, I'm going to let I'm going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves briefly, Carlos and Clayton. Uh, so, uh, I don't, but I'll begin here. Amanda, introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself, where, where you are, uh, and what jurisdiction you work for, and how long have you been dealing with fog. Hi there, I'm Amanda Albright. I currently work for the Hampton Roads Sanitation District. So we are the POTW in Hampton Roads, Virginia. Um, I, my office is located in Virginia Beach. I have been um, in the fog realm for about five years now. So I'm still kind of learning a lot, fresh out of it, but I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, let's see, Clayton, introduce yourself. I'm Clayton Brown. <clears throat> I worked for 30 years for Clean Water Services in Washington County, Oregon. And I was the industrial pretreatment program manager for Clean Water Services and was responsible for starting the fat oil and grease program in 2001, 2002. <clears throat> I retired in 2017 and went to work for Western States Alliance, which is part of the Pollution Prevention Resource Center in Seattle, Washington. <clears throat> and currently we do um, 
training nationwide under a Department of Agriculture grant for technical assistance. And so that's how I, that's how I got involved in FOG was making lots of mistakes when I'm trying to put my program together and mm -hmm. trying to keep other cities from making the same mistakes that I made. Yeah. Thanks, Clayton. Uh, and, and for anybody who wants information on uh, the uh, training you guys are going to be offering under the USDA grant for 2022, uh, get a hold of me or Eric and we'll get you in touch with Clayton if you if you want some information uh, about that and where a online course would be or a live. I guess you're going to be live this next year, I presume, right, Clayton? We have a few live classes that we're going to be offering. We were going through the, the grant material mostly along the eastern seaboard so well i think we're going to do some in california too but it's going to be um, maine georgia uh, possibly florida new york uh, those kind of areas because we've we've yet to do live training in those areas okay so. okay well we'll get people in touch with uh, with you guys uh, PPRC if they want to attend one of those uh, or tune into a virtual one if that's available also. Uh, Mr. Carlos Hernandez, can you uh, introduce yourself? Sure, sure. My name is Carlos Hernandez. I joined the county Department of Environmental Resource Management about 18 plus years ago. Um, uh, different roles eventually took over the water and wastewater division as, as their chief. And about 2014, um, I took over the fog control program from uh, other divisions within the department and um, addressed uh, many of the issues that came out of our third consent agreement with the federal government and uh, was in charge of developing our FOG program 2.0. Uh, we had started in uh, a FOG program probably in the 90s, mid 90s, um, based on the first time or as a result of the first time the federal government sued us. And uh, the third time, I think, was a charm, and we put together, uh, I think, a better fog control program. And it actually became effective in 2018, but we were concerned about ramping up from, you know, 1.0 to 2.0. So we actually started ramping up, uh, I'd say, about 2015 to 2018, pretty much implementing a lot of the rules we, were at, we actually passed in 2018 on a step-by-state -step basis, including probably some of the things we'll talk about today. So uh, welcome to all. And Thanks for having me here. Thanks, Carlos. Sarah, will you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Sarah Lim. Um, I manage the FOG program for the City of Springfield Department of Environmental Services in Springfield, Missouri. Um, I've been over here since 2013. And before that, I was a public health investigator with the health department as a restaurant inspector. Um, I started that about 2002. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, so I, we deliberately kind of called this list of people we wanted on the panel today to have a variety of different experiences and from a variety of different regions across the country. So I think we've done pretty good about that. Uh, so I have some questions and we're going to try to keep this, you know, we've got about 20 minutes to, to talk. So, you know, Clayton and Carlos, let's keep that in mind. We've got just 20 minutes to get some answers out here. All right. I mean, I have a relatively high degree of faith that Amanda and Sarah behave themselves, but not the other two. They know that they, they got a lot of experience. Let's just put it that way. That's why we're having them here. Uh, I'm going to start with Amanda. I'm going to ask this question of you, and then we'll, we'll probably do a little roundtable on this. Uh, which elements of your FOG management program are you most satisfied with and why? So recently we have gone through a lot of updates and can you know this very well <laughs> with our program HRSD's fog BMP is kind of unique in the sense that we treat our fog program as a gen like a general permit they're issued a general permit we have a very small program because we only have a less than 100 FSEs um, even though we're within Hampton Roads we all of the other 17 cities and localities within Hampton Roads, they have their own fog programs, their own fog ordinances. So we work closely with them to have some regional efforts. Um, and then we have our own um, BMP, best management practice that we use as a general permit for our, for our program. Um, some of the things that we have recently um, updated, which I was really excited for, which we updated the model fog ordinance uh, to include 
requiring um, some sizing standards for our, our technical sizing standards include the um, the use of non corrosive grease control devices. Um, they are also going into needing to be sized by flow control flow device, sorry, um, a gallons per minute and being needed to be sized by a grease production. So that is something that I'm really excited. And, and so far, the it was it went live at the beginning of the year. We've had a lot of success with that, with those aspects of it. Very good. Carlos, I want to ask you this one too, because I know you worked really hard on developing a program uh, from the almost from the ground up, if I remember. I mean, you had something, but not really what you have, anything close to what you have now. So I guess I guess what what um what am I most satisfied with our program? I think one of the I guess benefits of our program, at least from an operational point of view, is that it's very comprehensive from cradle to grave. So we're fortunate enough that that we integrate very well with with 34 cities and 16 utilities, and so we manage manage it from cradle to grave from the perspective of every development order, every certificate of use, every perceivable. Um, building permit goes through us at one point or another, and if it has fog, uh, anything related to fog in it or, or food service, uh, which is some, sometimes a little difficult to, to identify, uh, it goes through our, our office. And so we get to integrate with, with the 34 building departments, and we also get to integrate with the 16 utilities and public works departments. So we see, we see every aspect of it. So we approve a design. We issue operating permits for every every use. We have, I think, over 12,000 operating permits already. Um, and those are integrated also with multiple parts of our division, which include not only the fog side, the, the pump station side, the collection system side. So it's sort of this integrated annual operating permits, including um, issuing operating permits to the utilities themselves and the haulers. And so you have this sort of cradle to grave um, ability to manage the fog from the point of generation to the final point of disposal. Your program has something that's unique uh, throughout all the country uh, in that you do have uh, an ethylene concentration limit for enforcement, but you sort of, you came up with something that nobody ha else has done uh, in, in efficiency requirements. And I think it's so, so unique. You need to really uh, to talk just a little bit about that. Sure, I kind of forget about that every so often. It's been it's been a while, but so we we had a challenge, and and really when we we're rewriting our ordinances to kind of address the issue of performance, and it's always been very difficult to take enforcement on on a visual or something that you can't quantify. And there's been a lot of challenges to to use a quantifiable enforcement tool, right? And so you know when we were developing, I heard from everybody or the, most people that it would be very difficult. It would be inconsistent. EPA methods are not great, and it was going to be a challenge and sort of a disaster, but I, I have to say that wasn't the case. We also kind of had to figure out how do we make it so that it would work well with what's really you know reliable. So at the time, our old ordinance had a, a standard of 100 milligrams per liter of fog, um, and so you know that was the number we had. And so what we were challenged with by the EPA and the state as well was to to improve our fog ordinance so that we reduced the fog loading. And so we did two things. We, we, we uh, required a much more efficient system at a laboratory scale, right? So at a test scale. So we went from, a, I guess, the traditional or national standard of 90%. We went to 99% um, of capacity so that the unit is, is, is sized based on its capacity to hold uh, fog at 99%, not 90%. So we're basically creating a safety factor there on its volumetric capacity. And then at the same time, we actually raised the ethylene standard from 100 to 150 milligrams per liter. And so that was something that, that you know, a lot of folks thought the EPA would not approve. And, you know, we're, we're trying to reduce a, the amount of fog that's discharged. So how do you raise the standard? But actually, those two things actually worked really well together. Um, and what we find is it's very, very easy to consistently comply with 150 milligrams per liter um, when you have a high standard of, of, of or efficiency requirement up front. Haven't had any issues in that regard of implementing that. Um, and overall, if you think about what we were at, we were probably at 1,000 to 3,000 milligrams per liter typical effluent with, uh, with the old, old uh, concrete and metal box systems that were out there. And now we can consistently be below 150. So 
while we raise the standard to make it easier for people to comply on a consistent basis and address some of the some of the um, issues that, that come about from the anal analytical side of it, um, we we were very successful, I think, by implementing that 99% to, to offset that. And, and, uh, been, and uh, it's worked out really well for us in that regard. Okay, cool. And, Thank and you by the that. way, on, on, on an enforcement perspective, and I promise I won't be long-winded about it, we haven't had a single case that we take, have taken enforcement and, and we haven't had a successful challenge by anyone, I should knock on wood, um, based on our, on our approach. We, we sample once. If you exceed the, the 150, we give you notification. We'll be back in X days exactly. We'll tell you when we're going to be back and you prepare for it. And when you come back, we sample. You, you exceed that second, that second effluent standard. Automatically, full design, full resubmittal, full new system in place um, to 2.0 standard. Not debatable. No more. No more sampling. No more going back. Give us one more chance. And we have been, we've been challenged a number of times, and we've been successful every single time. Very nice. Okay, thanks, Carlos. Uh, Sarah, I want to ask you a little bit about your program because I know you did something that uh, was you were an early adopter of a different strategy. When it, and, and then I'm talking specifically here about concrete, as Carlos mentioned, the legacy tile type products in concrete and metal, and you guys decided to do something about that. Tell tell us that story. Um, well, early on, when I first um, came to work over here, I was uh, the only inspector in the program, just briefly, like maybe for four or five months before they started hiring other inspectors. But um, um, my bosses were always super cool with letting me kind of have free reign and just kind of experimenting and playing around and doing whatever I wanted. And I mean, we followed the code, but I was also allowed to, you know, just kind of look into things. And um I mean, just in the talking about when we decided to go away from concrete, prohibiting concrete as a material for grazing receptors, um, I we were looking at tanks empty because uh, most of them had never been looked at empty. And at the same time, I was kind of playing around with checking pH to see if you could use it as a regulatory, um, you know, some in, in, in our regulations of our interceptors. And um, I uh, was finding all kinds of collapsed baffles, holes in tanks, the bottoms would be out of the tanks, um, all kinds of damage. And at the same time, the pH level in the tanks was always below four. And so I approached my boss and I was just like, you know, I think that's probably a good idea to not use concrete anymore. Mm -hmm. And then we went and approached BDS and they agreed with us. And which is the cool thing about building development services here in the city of Springfield, this whole time, they've always been really good about deferring to us with grease interceptors in our department. Um, and uh, so in 2015, they just wrote into our adopted ordinance that concrete was no longer, would be a prohibited material. Okay, so that's, that is unique. I, I mean, I sh uh, it's not so unique anymore. I mean, Amanda, you guys don't allow, uh, well, you guys discriminate against concrete, isn't that right? Yes, we discriminate. HOC, for our FOG program, we don't allow concrete, um, but in regional region-wide for Hampson Roads localities, um, whichever locality you're in, they have the ability to say no, or if um, case by case, they can apply, an FSD can apply to use a concrete interceptor, and um, it can be up to the jurisdiction if they approve that or not. Okay. We do discriminate against them now. <laughs> yeah, you have what's your you? I think you have a. They have to meet a, a pH of three. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. But with a pH of three, okay. So that's that's sort of that all kind of flows from from what some of Sarah's studies early on with all the stuff she was documenting. So we knew that there was a we needed, you know, we need to be paying attention to the to having a lower limit on pH because they, they it is such a corrosive environment as as has been said. So. That's kind of cool. Clayton, let me ask you a different kind of a question. So I know you have been advocating for a long time that kitchen BMPs are not the holy grail. Uh, and I'd, I'd like you to talk about, you know, what, what, what's the alternative that you've been advocating for if you don't believe that, you know, that we're going to, we're going to leave a kitchen and they're going to behave themselves. I think from a business perspective, restaurants, and food service establishments, they make food, they sell food, they're catering to the clientele that want to come in and get away from the kitchen. And so most restaurant, the, the employees that work in restaurants and my granddaughter, my grandson, two, two of my boys worked in restaurants. 
Um, one of one of the guys that I work with now owned a restaurant in Portland. Actually, owned two, and they want to get they want to get good food on the table as quickly as possible, and then they want to get the the dishes and flatware off the table when the client's done. The customer wants to leave and get that stuff cleaned up so they can reload it and take it back out in the, in the dining room. They don't want to spend time scraping, wiping, et cetera, et cetera. So what, what we did in Washington County, Oregon, is we, well, it wasn't just us. It was the whole Portland metropolitan area. We, we banded together and we had the, the state uh, plumbing code changed in 2013 here in Oregon to require all fixtures and drains in the kitchen and food service area to be connected to an appropriately sized interceptor. That included dishwashers, I mean, everything. Everything in the kitchen and food service area went to the interceptor, which allowed a restaurant then to basically do their business and then have the, have the interceptor be the treatment process, not the garbage can. We also, we also talked to folks at the landfills where wipe grease and stuff like that was going. And at the time here in Oregon, some of the landfills are municipal, some are owned by uh, big corporations. They didn't really like the grease coming into the landfill because the, the bacterial breakdown of the grease happens fairly rapidly in a landfill environment and they weren't able to cap the landfill and capture the gas. They couldn't get it covered and packed quickly enough. So they don't like grease in a landfill. Um, okay. in, Portland and Gresham and Clean Water Services, we put in energy recovery facilities for brown grease at the wastewater plants to give our haulers someplace to go too. So um, best practices, they're, they, they're time consuming. In some cases, they don't work. We had several case studies in Hillsborough, Oregon, where we knew the restaurant owners. We had several restaurants on a line that was completely replaced in the street, a public line. The restaurants were family owned restaurants. The staff that worked there were long-term staff. They followed the, the kitchen best practices and we were still getting grease in the sewer line. Uh, that was before we required all fixtures and drains to be connected to an interceptor before the state did. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of where we were at then. And, and also part of, the, part of the information we took to the state plumbing board to get the plumbing code changed here in Oregon. Thanks, Ken. Yeah. Um, you're familiar with grease production as a sizing methodology. Is that something that you, uh, you know, are you a fan of that, or are you, you know, how? Give us your impression or, of that of that as a sizing tool or a step in the sizing process. And is <laughs> are you want me to do that? <laughs> just just your your impression. You've been you've been in the in the industry, and you said all fixtures have to get routed to an interceptor and all of that, and so just. You know, I'm thinking about the the you know if we're gonna if we're gonna say B and P's are are not our best friend, then size of the interceptor matters. And so, just your thoughts about that? What we found it, it's tough in Oregon or in Oregon the the pretreatment fog folks can't cannot dictate to a food service establishment right. what type of an interceptor they put in. So what we do is we give them information on. Um, calculators basically. Uh, Shear has the grease monkey. There's several others. Ken's developed one. We have a grease loading calculator on the Western States Alliance website that people can use. What we found is if we give that information to the owner or the, the person that's building a food service establishment, a restaurant, a food processing facility, they can use that calculator and determine whether they need to go above the minimum plumbing code. And almost every time we got we got feedback from people that, that based on grease production, the code was minimum and they went above the code in order to, to they were trying to size based on how often they needed to clean their interceptor out. So yes, right. it's, I'm a fan and, and it works really well. And we've gotten really positive feedback from both municipalities and restaurant owners. Okay, I know Sarah. You um, you mentioned that while you guys don't use grease production to size up front, you use it as a tool on the other side. Tell us about that. Yeah, yeah. So we um, we use the we size in accordance with the 2018 IPC, which is what we've adopted. But we use the grease production um, values to uh, determine maintenance frequency of all grease interceptors that we permit. 
which is um, about 1,100 grease interceptors that we permit. So, um, but yeah, we um, all grease interceptors have a known capacity. Even the concrete ones, we use the 25% rule to determine their capacity, and um, and that's how we determine how often they need to be maintained. Okay. Do you still have a bunch of the smaller point of views because they follow the code? And and do you find that you're having to deal with somebody that might have to pump their interceptor out multiple times in a month? Yes. Yeah, we do. We have, we allow indoor small grease interceptors and we have several. We have a pretty good sized downtown area that doesn't allow for larger grease interceptors um, and a, a couple other historical districts that don't allow for grease interceptors. Uh, larger grease, they only allow smaller ones. And uh, we do have a few um, in town that require weekly cleanouts, multiple times a week. Um, we even have some, you know, we have a Chick-fil-A that has a concrete interceptor still, and they uh, have 100,000 meals served a month, and they have to clean it every two weeks. My so, word. Yeah. That's got to be a line, a line up. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. We call it, we, we call it chicken strip. That's what we call that strip of road, chicken strip, because there's a KFC, there's a, there's a Canes, there's, it's, yeah, it's a mess. Wow, that's, that's, that's awesome. Well, I'm wondering, do, does, is compliance challenging when you're, as you start to get into that multiple times in a month? Yes. And we also allow people to self-maintain the indoor interceptors, the small ones. And so we may not get the manifest for those. Um, we accept grease at our treatment plant. We want grease. We, we like to get grease at our, our treatment plant. And uh, so if they're self-pumping, we don't know. We have to check that when we, they have to keep a log sheet. And we check that when we go and do their routine inspections. So it's, it's not, it's a challenge to our program and, you know, making sure they're cleaning it frequently enough. Right. Okay. That's, that's good. Um, Carlos, I know you don't, you guys, uh, on the subject of grease production, do you guys, you allow it, but I don't remember, do you mandate that they use something like that? Grease production? Yeah. We started requiring that before we changed the code. We, we, um, we started requiring it pretty early on when we realized that what had been approved in the past wasn't working and sizing it on flow is is wholly un, un, inadequate um and a, and a bad a bad approach to to um figuring out what size of equipment you would need and and there was a lot of a lot of a lot of pushback initially on that on that concept including even the the concrete issue and the ph we had a lot of pushback because we didn't have that codified yet so but we started changing what we would accept and what we used different different approaches to that. On the pH side, it was simple. There was we recognized the pH is as low as three, and so therefore the design had to address pH of three, whether it was codified or not. It was very simple to apply that. And same thing with the design capacity. We had a standard at that time. It was still 100 milligrams per liter. So we said, demonstrate to us you're going to meet 100 milligrams per liter, or size it like this. And so no one could ever come up with a different approach. And so we had that um, in in our in our uh, requirement very early on and and it stayed there and there was a there's a lot of debate and i've gone to many different places even you know outside the state and discuss that and there's always that that person that says you don't size you, you know you don't design an interceptor you you pick one and i was like if you want to fail you pick one but um the, the reality of it is well he says well there's there's no way for you to really estimate exactly what the production rate is and i go everything we do in en as engineers is never exact when you design a stormwater management system, a pump station, those are based on unit rates that are approximate and based on, on, on historical information, right? So we know that a certain storm has a certain frequency and a certain intensity. It's not exact. I mean, you know, but, right. but they're tools that we use as, as professionals to design things. And so it, it works very well. So you're, you're satisfied with that. And I, I didn't remember, but you're the, the pH issue. So you guys also restrict pH. Uh, we, we did before, 20, I'd say about 20. 15 or 16, we, 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 uh, and it was a huge battle. And the way we addressed it, even though it wasn't codified, we said, look, look at what a professional engineer, when they sign and see a document, they, they need to look at materials and compatibility uh, uh, with their design. And so all engineers have to design and address the material issue, regardless of, of what the code says. That's a minimum standard. So you can't design a concrete tank and have a pH of three. Those are incompatible. And so, you know, I had a huge number of 
well, you know, a, a large number of manufacturers that came in and says, you can't do that. And I said, our plans have to be signed and sealed by a PE. A PE can't sign uh, incompatible materials, right? So that resolved that issue and has been holding since. Then we codified it. It made it easier to codify it, but it was it was simple to implement. You don't need a code change to implement, uh, to not allow uh, a non-compatible material of an engineer to sign, sign a drawing or sign a submittal. Do you let, uh, right, we're running out of time here. So just a question here, just to kind of wrap up, but do you, do you allow for 90 day uh, pop-out frequencies or something between 30 and 90 days? Where are you guys at on time? We are, you know, our range definitely is, is, is from weekly to 90 days, depending on specifics. And we allow even more than 90 days under certain criteria, um, depending on, on the design, uh, pH and how it's monitored, whether it's monitored electronically or not. Okay. But generally it doesn't go over 90. Okay. Well, this is, this has been a fun conversation for me and we promised to keep this thing to 30 minutes and I would be delighted to be able to keep this conversation going for another hour, but uh, to keep to our time commitment to all of those who, who attended and to our panelists who took time out of their busy schedules to, to, to join us today. Thanks very much. And uh, if we can do this again, we'll try to do it again. Uh, we'll see what kind of feedback we get. I know there were a lot of questions in the chat box popping up. No way we could get to all of that. I uh, just wanted to kind of just have this brief conversation with pe people that are in the industry dealing with things. And uh, we hope in introducing the GB1000 that we've got a product that helps solve some of the problems that we're all still dealing with when it comes to fog abatement. With that, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Eric. Just wanted to thank you all for coming. And again, to uh, reiterate what Ken said about the comments, we got a lot of questions as well. Uh, we're going to go through those and certainly feedback directly to those folks that had questions. Uh, we will reach out to the panelists for sure. But uh, thanks for coming to uh, speak with us today, panelists. Certainly appreciate uh, the input. Um, thanks, every all the participants and uh, the attendees. And uh, please feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Jump on our website to check out some of the more specifications on the GB1000. Thank you. Hey, Eric and Ken, I want, I want to thank you both. I um, giving us the opportunity to kind of meet some of these other panelists. I was really happy to hear what they had to say. I've never met any of them. And so it was really great to hear what they say. It kind of reinforces some of the things that we've done over the years. And one of the things that helps kind of hear from other, other jurisdictions is sometimes you, you implement something, you're like, it makes perfect sense. It, we know it works, but it's nice to hear other people kind of have this, you know, identify the same issues, the pH issue, the pump out, the sizing, and some of the other comments that were made. I mean, that, you know, the fixtures and, and, and Clayton the, requiring all the fixtures to connect you know, which makes it easier for the for the restaurant to expand later on or do whatever they, they want to do and run their business how they want. That was really great to hear. It made my day to hear some of those comments. So thank you for uh, for uh, for all your input. Yes, thank you. It was great meeting you, especially these folks, because I've heard about them, talked to them, but I've never gotten to meet them before. So thanks. Nice guys. to put a name with a face. huh? Yeah, that's right. Or maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, folks, thanks very much and have a great day.